from Ontario Tech University. And I already presented him this morning. Uh, Akira was uh, formerly dean of students in, in this university. Now he's professor in energy and nuclear engineering. He has very impressive list of his achievements and history. And he works in the, the many organizations and uh, with different. I met him, by the way, 20 years, more than 20 years ago in GNC, which now JA now in Mita in Japan. First for the first time. After that, he was working in different organizations, and now he is a professor in Ontario Tech University. He published a numerous number of scientific publications, more than 200, and he also prepared more than 45 uh, master and PhD students up to for today. Okay, Tokuhiro uh, Sensei. Ah, last but not least, he is a member of Women in Nuclear Canada actively contributing to increase the role of the women in our nuclear engineering. Also as me, by the way, I am a member, I am a contributing member, means I pay uh, an annual fee of the women in nuclear in the IEA, and we again, together with uh, Akira, working on the inc increasing influence and role of the women uh, experts and women professionals in the field. Okay, Professor Tokuhira, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. I hope I get permissions. Okay. Can you see the... Yes, see. yes, you see we my can. presentation. Okay. Make a full screen, please. Good. Yeah, if, yeah. So, if you make okay. it full screen. Okay. Or probably you okay. first make a full screen, then share as a full screen, because now we, we, we see your. Ah, I see. Make full screen and. And then share oh. this, this window. Ah, I see. Okay, full screen first, and then and share. Okay, is that okay or no? I think it's again, again this uh, PowerPoint video. Ah, there may be a problem. Can you see the slide? The yes, first slide? okay, okay. Please go ahead with this oh. one. Yeah, let's go ahead with this. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Vladimir said, we met uh, maybe almost 25 years ago. So uh, I'm happy to be invited to give uh, this talk today. And uh, sorry I could not be with you. And thank you for people who are in person and, and online as well. Uh, and, and, and thank you to, uh, to Professor Kostolova uh, about uh, we, we were talking really about module one and uh, being very smart and aware of um, uh, all the things that are going on, especially in this year, 2022, with nuclear and renewables and hybrid energy systems. So I will take, uh, I will speak a little bit about uh, uh, hybrid energy systems. And this is just an introduction. So um, if you have technical questions or non-technical questions, uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, then please uh, email me. I just want to give you a short introduction in about 40 minutes or so. Uh, I just want to cite uh, my co-authors and um, a prof another professor here, Filippo Jenko, and uh, Mustafa Ciptioglu, who's uh, just finished his master's degree uh, last week. So thank you. Okay, slide two. Just a uh, uh, I, you can check my profile on LinkedIn. Uh, this is just a, um, I hope the, same, the slides changed. Uh, this is just a career summary of people and institutions above the, the diagonal and then the reactor concepts in the countries that I've worked in. I've had a very interesting career. Um, just this year, I was very lucky to, to teach at the World Nuclear University Summer Institute in, in Spain. 
So, uh, all right. So to start, uh, this is really a talk about nine electric applications of nuclear, but uh, first of all, um, I'm going to focus more on the, on the nuclear engineering, nuclear reactor type uh, types, um, but uh, we, you know that there are applications in, in, in isotopes and medical isotopes especially. So just want to give you... Um, Akira, uh, Akira, I don't think it, it's slide does move. Could you? Maybe you... Okay. Maybe I had to... Am I sharing the slide? Is, is it moving? It's to start. Ah. Okay, next one. Is it Non-electrical applications. It changed, but okay. I, be I believe you have two windows. One is full screen and another just small screen. PowerPoint. Ah, oh, let's see. I would say, okay, maybe try again. Stop sharing. And now start sharing. sharing and share a window with a full screen to avoid confusion. I learned this this so. morning, hard way. Share this one. Okay, what do you see now? Do you see the applications of isotopes? No, we, we don't see full screen. We see like... Oh, we see. Do you see the full screen now? No, we don't see full screen. It's still the same because. Ah, oh, I see. To make full screen, but it doesn't show. It shows still because it to share is even okay. First, you make f two <laughs> full screen, and then you will have two windows: one this window, and another with full screen. And then, you, when you start sharing, you share the one with full screen. It's like you. Okay. Okay. So now, do you see? No, this is, I, I believe now we see the desk. Oh, now, yes. Okay. Perfect. Now please. you see the slide applications? Yeah, please uh, click hide. Please click hide and you will see. Yeah. Do you see, do you see the slide? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, now it do you, goes. Do you see them? Basically. Yes, we see okay, perfectly. Do you see the isotopes? If you okay. click hide, Akira, if you click hide here in, in this small ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, here, okay. then we, perfect. Okay. Now perfect. Please go on. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the input. So uh, when we talk about non-electrical uh, applications, I should first start where the history of nuclear engineering or nuclear energy and radiation science. It started with radiation science. So uh, just uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I uh, just want to say uh, in summary, you know, there are over 700, 700 radionuclides with half-life longer than 60 minutes. And the 60 minutes is important because if you uh, if you, it's, it's 60 minutes really is related to the half-life of the radioisotopes, I think you know. And, and you have to apply many times the radioisotope in industry or in medical applications before the, the isotope disappears, right? So you're, you're, you're using it for, for, for imaging or um, cancer tr treatment, and you have to use it within the, the half-lives of the isotope. So cobalt-60 is a general one that I want to, 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 to give as an example because in technetium-99 metastable, because those are, can be produced using the nuclear reactor, but you have to, when you use a nuclear reactor, you have to put it in the reactor and you have to take it out and you have to deliver it to the application. So um, you have to think about that and uh, I just list the Wikipedia because if you have a cell phone, you can have access to Wikipedia, and that's a good starting point. It may not be completely accurate, but uh, it's a good starting point for many ways, uh, for many people around the world to, to, to look at the information that's contained in Wikipedia. Maybe sometimes uh, 
in French or Russian or, or, or Spanish in your own language that you're able to read uh, the same article. So that's the power of Wikipedia. So, okay. So uh, I will talk mainly in this presentation about non-electric applications, small modular reactors and renewable energy sources. Uh, and uh, based on my mostly US and Canadian experience, we go back to 2005, we thought we looked at uh, the US looked at the um, this uh, next generation nuclear plant NGMP or very high temperature reactor BHTR uh, with a gas cooled reactor uh, at very, operating at very high temperature and then a hydrogen production facility uh, that project started in about 2005, went to 2010. It was suspended in 2013. And one of the technical issues that, um, that you should remember is the regulatory, or the not what I call the non-technical aspect, the, uh, the regulatory uh, aspect, can you have a hydrogen plant, how close can you have the hydrogen plant to the nuclear mm -hmm. reactor? Can it be side by side? It really depends on the regulator and uh, that's an important point to remember. And we haven't really resolved that issue. So, um, and uh, at the same time, um, the, there were other uh, high temperature gas reactors, HTGR concept. South Africa had a Westinghouse pebble bed modular reactor. Arriva had the Antares high temperature gas reactor and General Atomics GA had a gas turbine um, modular helium cooled reactor concept as well. And again, uh, it's like the Wikipedia is an example. There is, a, there is an article in Wikipedia about next generation nuclear plant. So this is, uh, there are just two images of, uh, of, 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 of the concepts at that time. Um, it was quite uh, a bit of engineering and R&D, but uh, it stopped in 2000. Uh, essentially fully suspended in 2013, stopped in about 2010. Now, uh, I just want to go back to, to what uh, uh, Professor Kosolov said about uh, beyond the NGMP and VHTR initiatives, we now have in 2020 or 2022 uh, SMRs, and we have the, the IAEA uh, booklet on advances in small modular reactors. We also have the OECD, NEA, small modular reactor challenges and opportunity. And if you have access to your cell phone, there are two applications, one called GridWatch, one called Electricity Map. GridWatch, and these are apps that you can download on your cell phone, and they give you essentially the live data of the plants that are operating and the carbon footprint in that particular region or country. Uh, and GridWatch is one for Ontario. It gives you the energy portfolio for, for Ontario, Canada, and tells you the footprint. And um, I think uh, from looking at the carbon footprint of many different countries, uh, the emerging, I think the emerging reference is about 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, lower than 50 grams would be much better. I saw that in Germany just the other day, it was, it was 790 grams. Uh, uh, and uh, that's because you're using coal power plants. Uh, Ontario is typically sometimes less than 10 grams, but typically 10 to 75 grams, about 60% nuclear in Ontario, Canada, 30% uh, hydroelectric and about 10% uh, natural gas and renewables and we don't have any, we have closed down all our coal plants. So um, look at, if you have time, uh, download the grid watch or electricity map. Those are very nice uh, apps to get a live, to get real live data. Okay, the references there are the IAEA and the OECD, NEA. All right, so uh, issues and challenges. I. I can give you uh, kind of low, medium, and high, uh, just to make some comments. Remember, uh, this is the awareness module one type knowledge. Um, we, we talk a lot about digital twins, and they require 
uh, high performance computing re resources and uh, although national laboratories or laboratories research labs have high have access to high performance computing resources it unlikely to be a substantial use of these uh, because it's not available at the engineering or technology development level uh, to reactor vendors right so um, Although it's an exciting field, you have to remember there's a difference between research versus technology development. And uh, something related to the previous conversation about competencies and modules, um, you know, we talk about thermal hydraulic concept, concepts that are, are now dated and we need to maintain the knowledge or preserve the knowledge. And uh, there are fewer and fewer universities at least in, in North America, teaching courses or modules about fast reactor theory, sodium and liquid metal thermal hydraulics, fusion reactor concepts, and turbulence theory. And uh, I think the bottom line is that knowledge preservation is very important. And also, um, those of you who are younger may need not need books, but we used to learn many things using uh, textbooks, and some of those textbooks are out of print, or many of those textbooks are out of print and disappearing. So uh, although you can, you can find them on Amazon, they become collector's items and they become very expensive, right? So you know that they have been out, out of print for many years and they, be, they become collector's so, uh, items. So um, the fourth bullet here is the cost and price of technology solutions the return on investment, ROI, um, the global supply chain, uh, and the disinformation, misinformation in the shared communications world that we live in with social media. And, and of course, we have um, many examples of polarizing uh, G7 level geopolitics. So you have to have an awareness of all these things in promoting nuclear, advancing the, the the need very much, very much the need for nuclear energy. Okay, um, not in any priority or, 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 or um, order. Uh, I, I just want to stress that uh, not, it's a non-technical, the financial uh, aspects or the sustained investments uh, relative to the progress of uh, completion of the SMR design and engineering is important. Um, the the lack of um, or the regulatory review and approval, if you have a regulator and the approval of a design uh, is important in North America, a new scale SMR is still the only one uh, that has uh, nuclear regulatory commission approval. Uh, and there are other, of course, uh, national initiatives and that's very important in operating, constructing SMRs of any type uh, of own design and, and, and then there's unclarity or uncertainty about the export of the design. Uh, it may be built in one country, but the, the export policy may be uh, a non-technical issue and, and, and unclear. So how many uh, SMRs do we need? We have about 425, 430 uh, nuclear reactors. If you look at uh, a model climate change and for example, uh, maintaining the the, the uh, temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, we need something on the order of 4,000 to 8,000 nuclear reactors, small or large. So there is a large number of, of reactors that we need. How, how many, how soon is really the question that you have to, to ask to be, to show awareness of, of what the challenge, technical challenge will be. And then, uh, differences in, 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 in recognizing differences in the funded approach. Um, in, in North America, we tend to, to, to look at uh, the commercial sector and uh, getting the funding uh, for this expensive technology, nuclear energy, nuclear reactors is, 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 uh, is very difficult. Uh, and then, um, uh, technical and partially non-technical is, is that we don't really have a reference design with, like we have with light water reactors, pressurized or bottom water reactors. And for example, the IAEA uh, SMR simulator does exist, but the probabilistic safety assessment or risk assessment model for this does not exist as far as I know. 
Okay. Now, hydrogen. Uh, there's a, been a lot of talk about hydrogen, excitement about hydrogen this year uh, in social media. There's talk about ammonia as well. Uh, rem remember, ammonia is um, in some of your basic chemistry. Again, you know, looking look at um, uh, Wikipedia, is not ammonia is not an energy carrier. It's a toxic gas, and its uh, cyclic efficiency is very low, net less than 20 percent. Um, in order to produce, um, uh, let's say, kilo 10 kilowatt hours, you know, you have the the, you have the electrolysis, the Haber-Bosch uh, plant equipment costs, new standards, manufacturing investments for tankers, loading, offloading facilities, um, fuel cell and gas turbine needs. And you, you just may get, uh, after all that, only although you, you, your target is 10 kilowatt hours, you may only get one to two kilowatt hours, right? So um, at that efficiency. Uh, for that whole entire process. So you have to keep that in mind. And then uh, and remember that, um, that you may have endothermic or exothermic reactions. The thermodynamics is important, but the chemical kinetics really can determine the time scale and the use of catalyst is important. And now uh, if you use catalyst, um, and especially nanomaterials, then you do have a supply chain issue. Do you have the catalysts and are they available in sufficient quantities to control the chemical kinetics? The thermodynamics may be favorable, but chemical kinetics and the use of catalysts is very important. So um, so there's potential depletion and, and, a, and a price demand for, for, for these typical catalysts like platinum, nickel, rhodium, and other catalytic materials. And I saw a post uh, as an example in social media where we tend to share uh, technical and non-technical information. I'm um, just citing Paul Martin, who wrote about ammonia and the cyclic efficiency of ammonia, and that it's not an energy carrier. OK, so um, yeah, so let me talk a little bit uh, about the investment and financing challenges. Uh, there's the technology readiness level. Also, uh, it's in Wikipedia. You have nine levels here. Uh, we need to talk really about a common technology readiness level. There's one um, by the European Commission. Um, you know, you start uh, at level one, the basic principles, and then, um, and then at, by level nine, you're talking about uh, approved and operational environment, or, or TRL eight, syst systems complete and qualified. So. So you have to think about this in terms of, it's not just designing the reactor. You have to be cognizant of um, all the things that, uh, all the TRL skills. And we have that in, in other fields like the aerospace uh, uh, industry that uh, are large scale, uh, as an example. All right, now, with startups and financing, uh, I won't talk too much about, about that, about this, but, uh, if you plot the revenue versus time, um, and uh, we have a lot of you know we have a lot of startups all over the world, um, startups cannot and, and the one and the, and the startups on the right are the ones that have uh, have uh, failed, um, and and the reason for that is um, you need constant need investment to, to take the first step, the second step, the third step, in order to finish the design. Initially, you're doing it really out of pocket at your own cost. And uh, although um, people who think of startups, um, you know, they, they want to maybe um, want to start up and eventually sell and retire young, or uh, you may want to help humanity and undergo, undergo uh, financial hardship. But uh, getting to the end, finishing the design and engineering is very important. Okay, so, uh, and for that, you can only make as much progress in your design and engineering as you have uh, sustained investors. So that's the point I want to make with this slide. So there needs to be awareness of that, that uh, reality if you work in a startup financing cycle with uh, investors um, uh, interested in, in investing in technology. Okay, um, just, reg just a word about regulation. Um, this is really critical also. I, 
sorry about the resolution on the slides, but there is a harmonization movement that is uh, may take, um, gee, how, you, you have to ask how many years will it take? Uh, can you, re, can you uh, agree uh, with all these different types of reactor? What is a nuclear reactor? What do all different concepts have in common? I would say, for example, that you have to have reactivity control, you have to have a core and fuel, but the core can, uh, for example, in the molten salt reactor, it doesn't have to be stationary, it doesn't have to be solid, right? So um, we have to um, agree internationally on what, in terms of regulatory and uh, technical agreement, what is a nuclear reactor, okay? So we still have uh, quite a bit of work to do there, but uh, it can't, you really cannot go fast enough. Okay, so let me talk about now the technical issues and coupling SMRs to renewable systems. Uh, here's the Envision co-location of an SMR and a concentrated solar power plant. This is, we looked at this, you know, you can think of adding uh, a wind, wind, um, wind to solar, solar uh, photovoltaic, and energy storage. Uh, but we looked at this first, and I'll tell you the reason why. And this is for both electricity production and hydrogen production. Uh, and we use uh, a concentrated so um, solar power plant using molten salt so that you could have a higher temperature uh, in this case, a hydrogen cycle, a copper chlorine cycle. And, and uh, the dotted line, the reddish brown dotted line is the, the site boundary. And I, as I said before, can you have a regulatory guideline or a rule that the hydrogen plant can be right next to the nuclear power plant, the small modular reactor in this case, uh, because otherwise you, you lose, you start to lose efficiency through heat losses. If, if the nuclear plant is located in one place and the um, concentrated solar power plant or solar, solar or, or alternative or renewable energy plant is 10 kilometers away, that means if you want to use any of the thermal energy, then you have to have a thermal energy uh, pipeline essentially, that's 10 kilometers you're going to lose heat. So it makes sense to, to have the uh, renewable plant, especially if you're using the thermal energy, only one kilometer away, for example. And, and are you allowed to permit it to do that by regulation? Okay, so uh, this is the simplified plant that we uh, modeled. Uh, my my uh, Professor Jenko and my my uh, master student uh, Mustafa, we looked at of course uh, using the CSP, uh, the copper chlorine cycle. If you use a gas cooled reactor, you may be able to go to a iodine sulfur iodine or uh, iodine sulfur cycle, a higher temperature, 900 degrees, and you have um, essentially here two different kinds of power conversion energy conversion systems one for the CSP, one for the, for the nuclear power plant. And then you're supplying both thermal energy, electrical energy to a copper chlorine cycle that operates uh, as, as depicted. And um, yeah, you may be able to, uh, you have kind of a de facto energy storage through the uh, hydrogen. Uh, we didn't look at that, but you could use an emergency diesel generator not an emergency diesel generator, but emergency hydrogen generator, uh, so that the nuclear power plant could operate in the island mode or isolated from uh, not needing the external uh, power, electrical power from the external grid. Okay, so the main challenge here is really an intelligent control system um, with a, a quasi steady output from the nuclear power plant and coupled to a very much a fluctuating output from the CSP or renewable source, okay? All right, here's just, just the types of reactors. A spec sheet on the temp outlet temperature, which may determine the uh, hydrogen production cycle that you may use. Of course, you can use electrolysis as, and just use the electricity. Um, 
uh, as well. And uh, these, the numbers, the references numbers are in the thesis that will be out in about two weeks, I think, uh, officially to the, the public. So um, these are essentially the generation four reactor concepts. And um, with each one, you can, you can imagine uh, coupling them to a renewable plant or through an energy storage to produce hydrogen and electricity. Okay, here are the applications of the different reactor types and different um, mostly heavy industry applications, uh, methanol production, coal gasification, blast furnace steel making, which is, has the highest temperatures. You have to have probably a very high temperature reactor, a gas cooled reactor uh, in that case to, to, to use the heat um, for blast furnace steel making. And thermo, uh, th thermochemical Hydrogen production is here listed as between 600 and 950 degrees C. Main methane reforming through hydrogen produ production, 400 to 800 and so forth. So, and then um, at the very low end, which is still very important, uh, is the district heating is essentially from 150 to 200 or so. Uh, but you need, and, and, and seawater desalinization is also important, are lower, but you don't throw away the lower grade thermal energy as well. Okay, here is the kind of the uh, economics of uh, carbon uh, capture and uh, storage, use and storage, uh, CCUS. Uh, here are the, the colors of hydrogen that you may have heard about and the target prices in US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. And these are just metrics uh, and of course, um, to be competitive against other energy, hydrogen against other energy sources, you want it to be essentially about a dollar per kilogram. Um, just look at the, the petrol prices uh, in where you are. Um, so right now, the petrol prices are about a dollar 40. So in order to be competitive, the hydrogen cost uh, has to be about dollar thirty, dollar thirty-five, dollar forty, and um, of course you don't want to to generate hydrogen using coal because you're not then you're not really contributing to uh, energy transition to a lower carbon or net zero carbon. Okay. All right. Um, there are four demonstration projects in the U.S. under the U.S. Department of Energy (DOE) uh, right now at these nuclear plants and they're essentially providing electricity for low temperature electronics, electronics, just as a demonstration that you can have a nuclear plant using and using the electricity produce hydrogen for, um, the local economy or transport economy of, uh, of the, the energy uh, supply chain. So, and um, yeah, uh, Palo Verde, for example, hydrogen, hydrogen expected in 2024, um, and Davis Bessey in Ohio, hydrogen production is expected in 2023. And the first one, uh, by the end of 2022, we're at the end of 2022 or early 2023, nine point in, in the state of New York, low temperature electrolysis from this, uh, from, um, um, from this high uh, constellation is the utility plant. Um, that's the case. Okay, and there's the reference. Okay, challenges in operational methods. Um, yeah, so when you look at the problem, you have um, a semi to fully automated applied, uh, it's essentially a semi to fully automated applied control problem. Uh, you have uh, a nuclear reactor and the SMR, uh, maybe multi-unit. Uh, you may have uh, in mind hydroelectric renewables uh, and wind and solar that actually fluctuate uh, hourly. So you need the data in order to do the energy modeling, the system level energy modeling. And that's um, why we went to the CSP. We found a CSP plant that had uh, one year of, of daily data in hours, uh, 8,760 or 8,800 hours, uh, in order to to really get, really look at the uh, the constant uh, demand 
a nuclear source and then a fluctuating demand from the solar source. And you may be able to put in insert, although we did not look at it, an energy storage source that may give you uh, a time lag or um, give you flexibility in, in operation. And then, uh, as I said before, you need to look at uh, offsite electrical power and you need to design the SMR so that it can operate in island mode without the need for offsite electrical power. So under any event, under you know any, um, especially in, in accident conditions, you need to be able to operate in, uh, without the need for offsite power because that was a problem with the Fukushima. Okay, and you may be able to learn, uh, use um, uh, uh, analytic data analytic methods like neurofuzzy method, machine learning methods for steady state operational data analytics. Uh, and some limited cases of, of transients. Um, and remember at the very bottom, that's a, a non-technical characteristic of uh, nuclear, nuclear power plants is, is that it's, it's the most regulated of uh, compared to renewables, for example. Okay, here's the uh, system advisor model uh, from the national, uh, US National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL. Um, it's called the system advisor model. It has, this is just a, a, a screen shot of uh, capture of that model. Um, it can accommodate uh, many things uh, that are not nuclear, solar PV, battery storage, CSP, wind, geothermal, biomass, and fuel cells. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a very good um, uh, techno-economic software model for, for looking at the aspects. You need, if you, if you couple it to a system level analysis of a nuclear plant or an SMR, you need to make a model of the nuclear plant, the SMR, and you need to couple it to, to, to this uh, system, SAM, uh, system advisor model. Okay, so, so uh, some assumptions. We looked at, um, with this uh, master's degree thesis study from research study from uh, Mustafa, uh, we looked at a California site. Uh, it's high desert in California, Daggett, California in the US. There is uh, one year of data, um, solar data, and the perform output performance fluctuates because of solar data. Um, and it has extreme temperatures, um, uh, very cold at night, but very hot in the afternoon and so forth. So, and, we, and with the molten salt um, use for the CSP, we could then use a copper chlorine cycle. And we assumed uh, a current regulatory framework uh, both plants, both the solar and the nuclear plant can in generate electricity and hydrogen. So we didn't assume any nuclear energy storage um, uh, other than um, that you will produce hydrogen, but we didn't look beyond producing the hydrogen. And, um, you, and the other constraint in the modeling and simulation is that neither the nuclear power plant or CSP cannot produce electricity or, nor uh, hydrogen only. So you cannot have uh, them producing 100% each electricity and no hydrogen or only hydrogen and no electricity. So uh, we looked at that, um, that, those constraints. Okay, this is just an example uh, of some early results. And um, yeah. So we looked at uh, four seasons, the spring, summer, fall, and winter, um, and uh, looked at the percentage of electricity generated and hydrogen production. Uh, the plot on the right top is the electricity in kilowatt hours. And um, here, just the res early results. Uh, the lower right is shows the different types of um, a different kind of optimization uh, that uh, you may have on maximizing the profit and maximizing the uh, hydrogen generated. And uh, uh, we also considered uh, what does what happens when you have an unanticipated transient at the nuclear power plant. Uh, we said 
uh, a reasonable uh, first order cutoff is four hours. You may not notice for four hours that you have some transient happening, but at four hours, you know, you have to say under four hours, at four, within the first four hours, you may shut down. Uh, 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 but uh, actually to look in detail, it's important to look at two, four, eight, 16, 24, and 48 hours uh, in terms of the, the uh, unanticipated transient at the MPP. So this is just an example. Um, as I said, the thesis will be coming out in about two weeks. Okay, on data analytics and, and methods, I just wanna say a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, here's a paper uh, that um, going back to, all the way back to 2009. It seems that for thermal, uh, ener thermal systems and uh, engineering design, that this uh, backward propagation, leibniz marquard algorithm, leibniz marquard is in Wikipedia. You can look at that and look at this paper. But um, I haven't followed up since, but there seems to be um, uh, this method, the backward propagation, leibniz marquard method, seems to be well suited for thermal energy uh, systems uh, engineering design. So instead of, Instead of looking for um, uh, um, different kind, looking at different kinds of methods, you might start with this backward propagation Leibniz marker algorithm as a starting point because there is certainly some a little bit of evidence that this seems to work well. Okay. Now, um, I want to say something about complexity and uh, design complexity and optimization. Uh, whenever you have these um, these uh, nuclear uh, renewable or nuclear renewable plus solar or plus uh, storage systems, if you look at the total number of variables and um, parameters, you have a complex system. And uh, complexity was studied um, by, um, again, um, based on Wikipedia, by Wilfredo Pareto. And you have um, this thing called the Pareto efficiency or optimality. And you have um, this optimization problem where um, if you use heuristics, you often use heuristics to solve a complex problem. Um, but you may have, in, in terms of practice, in, in, in a practical sense, does not guarantee an optimal or near perfect problem approach, but nevertheless reaches a short term goal or approximation. So you may not have the optimal or the maximum or minimum, but it gives you a practical solution. And that's that may be what you need. Okay, so uh, and then you have this Pareto, um, front, what's called the Pareto front in the upper right. And for each of those squares, you may have a set of variables and parameters for which you did the simulation, but you're trying to determine this front and you may want to use AI or machine learning to, to know where you are on the front um, in terms of overall system design. Okay, now in, or, in order to use heuristics, uh, just some heuristics that I've used over the years, I want to introduce the Lenbit length, energy, number scale, distribution, information, time scale um, as a high level um, when you do the engineering design. And also when you talk to stakeholders, uh, they may not understand the details of the science, but you really have to talk, uh, as we say in English, apples and apples, oranges and oranges, not apples and oranges. So you may want to talk about um, these metrics, uh, these six metrics. Okay. Let's see, how much time do I have? Okay, almost done. All right. Um, in terms of thermal hydraulic systems, you often talk about uh, pressure, temperature, mass flow rate, valve position, and liquid level. And uh, this, I use these as heuristics that uh, are. Um, well suited. There may be others, but you, all, you certainly have to talk about uh, in terms of the state of the system, the thermal hydraulic system, uh, uh, mostly these uh, uh, 
these heuristical parameters, metrics. Now, uh, when you talk about um, unanticipated uh, transients or conditions, then I use a different set. Um, you're talking about a system or a subsystem. You're talking about the state of the system or subsystem. You're talking about what resources, engineered or non-engineered resources that you have, and how are you going to respond uh, using those that resource. So, so uh, I call this S2, R2. OK, partial conclusions. Um, um, integration and diversity are really important. It's really my opinion. There's a tendency to look at standalone energy solutions. You know, we tend to, to design the reactor uh, separate from other sources. And, and when you have hybrid nuclear plus hybrid energy systems or nuclear plus renewables uh, with storage, for example, then you have to look uh, at the entire system. It's important to, to consider an entire system. Uh, multiple unit nuclear sites coupled to one or more renewable sources with energy storage or without energy storage, generating hydrogen, electricity, district heating. Um, how much energy, really, the question is how much energy can be extracted starting from hopefully a higher temperature. Um, yeah, and, and, and we really need to talk to, nuclear people need to talk to, um, in my opinion, to renewable people, to fossil fuel people, subject matter experts, uh, really very soon. And we need to be cognizant of uh, social media because public acceptance can really kill a, uh, a nuclear, uh, any nuclear project. And we need to develop analytically optimization methods, Pareto-like approaches, heuristic approaches in energy technologies uh, because of the complexity of, of these systems. Okay, so here's the, here's the, here's the um, SMR with energy storage, uh, wind power as well, maybe add uh, a steady hydroelectric supply as well to the CSP, producing hydrogen, uh, electricity, district heating, and so forth. Okay. And um, yeah, this is just an example of electrical energy. There is a large electrical energy project um, uh, that was, um, that was uh, in the news, but it said that it can only store electrical energy for 10 minutes of a equivalent 1300 megawatt electric, uh, nuclear power plant or, or nuclear or large scale energy plant. So gosh, uh, electrical storage is, um, is, 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 is really still very small. And there's the example of the Klaferke uh, Lint Liman in Switzerland uses um, uh, water storage. And um, that's uh, also in Wikipedia. Um, with any infrastructure project, how many and how much and how soon are really the key questions. OK, here's some references to start. I, I didn't list all the references. I just want you to, to see the references and to, to start. And uh, I'll, one thing about uh, uh, nuclear waste, because that question is always asked, it's uh, we have deep re geological repositories, but uh, and public acceptance is really a challenge. But we only need to, to look, we also need to look at uh, uh, plastic waste, for example relative to radioactive waste, uh, because there's, there's that, the scale of plastic waste is globally is, is much larger than radioactive waste. Okay, I'll be uh, ready to, to take some questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Tokuhiro. So any questions to, to Professor Tokuhiro? Yes, please. Hello. Going through the lectures, uh, is it really worth able to produce uh, hydrogen by reactors? As the amount of produced uh, is very low. Yeah. So, so that's a very good question. So part of it is is non-technical. Um, sometimes you have to produce a technology, although it may be inefficient because there's a lot of public interest, right? 
Um, so that's part of the in interest. Although as an engineer, you may know that technically it's, it's very low efficiency, but does the general public understand what high efficiency is compared to low efficiency? Um, you know, I drive a hybrid automobile and I made the calculation um, four or five years ago when I bought the hybrid automobile. How high does the gasoline price have to be, the petrol price have to be uh, on, on, on the money I paid to buy this hybrid automobile, right? But not everybody makes that calculation, right? So sometimes you, you make, you, you buy the car because it's the one you want and you, it has the right color. So it can be based on, 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 the, on, on a non-technical decision, right? When you have the enthusiasm, then you, you are willing to pay in spite of a low efficiency. So maybe that's not a satisfactory answer, but that can happen. Okay, so interesting, thank you. interesting answer. So just to, to extend this question, let's say I had this uh, in, in the reports that one gigawatt nuclear power plant can generate hydrogen, I know whatever is hydrolysis or whatever, but uh, which will be enough to feed 400,000 average cars per year. Okay, per year or whatever, because it's in, in per year. From the other side, you, you, if you make simple calculations, the electricity produced by this one gigawatt standard power plant will be potentially enough to feed two million Tesla cars. So it's five times more. Of course, there is a problem of storage and blah, 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 but still it's like you can uh, spend this, okay, use this electricity to drive five times more cars than with hydrogen. And unless it's uh, solved, I think it, could you comment on this? Okay, simply. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So I think the, the answer is if you combine uh, well, if, if you have a nuclear power plant, is, is already the case, or if you combine, if you add a renewable energy plant to a, a nuclear plant to produce hydrogen and electricity, it depends on the location, right? Mm -hmm. If you produce hydrogen, for example, for hydrogen vehicles, then you st we already have um, about a billion fossil fuel vehicles in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you go to uh, some countries, I'll, I'll give you an example where I've been to, um, Argentina, you see a 50 year old car still being used. Mm -hmm. And those people that drive a 50 year old car do not have the economic means to buy a Tesla. So um, if, we, if we replace automobiles uh, one billion automobiles we have to replace with electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles, non-fossil fuel vehicles, it may take 50 years, right? Because you have people still driving those fossil fuel old vehicles. So you have, um, you have the, well, return on investment is, 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 a, is a spatial temporal. It's, it's, it depends on where you are, right? So if you're in, in, in Western Europe, or Eastern Europe, and you can build a nuclear power plant, you can build a hydrogen plant, and you can tell, you can sell a Tesla that people will buy, but that's not the same solution. You, that solution does not work for many parts of the world, like South Latin America, or Africa, or Southeast Asia. It only works in really, uh, in today's world, in G7 countries, right, or G20 countries. Well, even G20 countries, it will only partially work. So, um, yeah, it's um, it take it takes. The answer is it will take uh, Vladimir. It will take time, right? It will take maybe take 50 years. And do we? The question is, do agree. we have 50 years? This is I agree, but the still for me from technical, not from investor point, from technical. For the electric mm -hmm. car, you already have all infrastructure. You have Tesla here in the US, you have in China, a lot of electric cars, or everything is ready. For hydrogen, you have to produce everything. First of all, 
You have to yeah. produce hydrogen somehow, okay? Which is yeah. another issue. Yeah, then you're you right, you're right. So we because, don't have the... And also you, yeah. have, you need these hydrogen cars. Of course, uh, this, this is a little bit complicated, huh? Okay. This is yeah, you're right, you're right. But I understand you're, you're your point. I understand your point also. Any we don't have the infrastructure for hydrogen in technology development wise. Yeah, we don't have that. We don't have it today. But um, it's possible. I think yeah, engineers yeah. can engineers can decide, mm -hmm. and will decide that uh, there's a lot of excitement about hydrogen, but it really is not going to work. We have one more question here. Uh, yes. Uh, Professor Tokuyo, thank you for your uh, attractive presentation. I have uh, two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First, about the uh, licensing challenges. Uh, you talk about uh, uh, technologies in uh, North uh, America and say that the just new scale uh, SMRs is licensed by the NRC. Uh, and uh, between uh, many of the uh, uh, technology that's under developing, so uh, in another slide, uh, you say that uh, uh, you said about uh, challenges uh, in operational uh, methods, and uh, in a, one another uh, uh, slide, you say that nuclear power by far from the most uh, regulate, uh, regulated. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, what's your prediction about the future of the SMRs for uh, Canada and uh, North America? Uh, it's very important oh. for me ab about your prediction. Uh, yeah, in replacement so in the energy port uh, profile uh, of the Canada or uh, USA. It's my yeah, first question. So for, yeah, yeah, thank you. So first of all, I, I have to really thank Vladimir for this because uh, I, from the list of participants, um, you, you have a financing model that are national and we need more details about activities in China, in Russia, even in Argentina, uh, in Korea. There are many different kinds of SMR concepts. If you base SMR development and regulatory approval based on a commercial investments, then uh, it's, although you have about 80 different types of concepts, only maybe uh, I would guess, my first guess would be less than 10 will be, will get to the end and will actually be constructed. Maybe only five out of the, out of the 10 out of the 80 will be constructed because there's enough investment, right? So um, that's, um, that's a practical outlook. You, you hope that all 80, but will be, constructed, but I, I doubt it very much because if you look at other industries, you see that we have less than less than 10 automobile makers, less than 10 air, uh, aircraft, commercial aircraft makers. Um, you'll, you'll see only a, only a few, uh, less than 10. So that may be the case for nuclear power plants and SMR concepts. Um, so, and as far as the regulatory harmonization, I think it's a great movement initiative, but how long will it take for international consensus agreement on what a reactor is and what should be harmonized? Uh, for some people, for some nations, it may, it may be that you say, oh, the NRC has approved the new scale design we have the money, we will accept the NRC approval so that we don't have to do it on our own or we have to do just the minimum regulatory approval and we will build this plant in our, in our region or in our country, right? So uh, let's see if this actually happens. I think it will save a lot of time uh, in, in some places, in, especially in, in emerging nuclear nations, if you accept uh, a certain type of SMR design as already 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 sa uh, safe and approved. Uh, okay. Thank assuming that assuming that it, assuming that it can be exported. Uh, okay. Thank. Uh, I really got your uh, uh, your comment. It's very uh, attractive. And uh, uh, the NRC uh, approval. It's uh, 
after an RC approval, the investment is very important. Uh, so uh, my yes. next question uh, is about the uh, uh, licensing of the uh, combined hybrid, hybrid nuclear and renewable energies. Uh, how do the must uh, uh, how the licensing must be uh, the, this this energy system must be licensed. There isn't any uh, experience about uh, for example hybrid. Uh, uh, hydrogen production uh, uh, besides the nuclear power plant. I think, in my opinion, it's a really challenge. Uh, what's your uh, opinion about this issue? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, that's a very, very good question. I think you have to, when you have a combined plant, and you have to look at, you have to look at the technical safety issues. So. For the nuclear plant, we know them. I think you know them. I won't. I won't go over them. But for the hydrogen plant, is you can have. It's what is the probability, low probability but high consequence, of a hydrogen explosion? Can it impact the safety and operation of the nuclear plant? Right. So then, what is the distance that you have to maintain, or what are the barriers that you have to construct or think of? in the combined nuclear plus renewable or hydrogen plant um, area that you designate as an, an exclusion zone, for example, okay? So I think that you have to, I, 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 my, my opinion is that you have to look at the safety issues of the combined plant. Okay, okay thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for your, thank yeah. you, Akira. Mm -hmm. I have, I also have a question now. Yes, you raise it that actually. Okay, good. So it's related to your question, which you raised in one of your slides. How many SMRs we need? How soon we need them? Let's say I did. All, I have been trying to answer this question. Uh, if you if you want to be let's say net zero in 2050, uh, let's say you want to that SMRs will be producing 10% of electricity required in 2050. Then knowing the projections, how, how, how much electricity you need in production you need in 2050, you can easily calculate that from 2030, is I assume the first day, then we can start deploying SMRs. You will need to start three 77 megawatt electric SMRs every day. For comparison, mm -hmm. Boeing produces two airplane, I mean civilian airplanes per day. So this mm -hmm. is a big challenge. Uh, in principle, possible, of course, because plane makers, they can do it. But then you need as many, let's say, SMRs approximately as uh, airplanes. Mm -hmm. but, so that means, okay, but maybe we, we should not put this always that SMRs are a solution for the climate change because it's the, okay, I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but it seems to me it's very difficult if SMRs can contribute to, to this goal at least up, up to 2050. Could you comment on this? Yeah, yeah, so uh, I think, uh, let me, we, we are thinking alike, but we say different things. I, I think it's, I said as as I said in my talk, we have about 430 nuclear power plants in the world operating, or in in, uh, in some state of operation. Uh, if you look at if you look at the if you do the macro techno-economic model, uh, using for example the what's called the Dice model, it's a climate change model, and if you want to maintain reduce the the carbon footprint by 2050 or 2060 or 2070. We looked at it, I looked at it, I asked the same question that you did. So I looked, I went all the way to 20, year 2100, starting in 2020. Yes, you have to build at a tremendous rate. And then you ask, do we have the workforce? Do we have enough construction cranes? Um, because those may be bottlenecks. So I guess they, um, I'm not sure that I have the answer, but I know um, as an engineer, I'm always looking at the uncertainties 
and and I'm a I'm, I'm a bit of a pessimist. I worry about um, how how can we do this as engineers and as technical people, mm -hmm. and it looks almost impossible. I always say, I I would say I hate to be a pessimist, but uh, <laughs> many people have hope, right? And for an engineer, hope is uncertainty. <laughs> so, um, so <laughs> I would, sure, I understand that people have hope, but for me, it's uncertainty, and I want to look at the details of the uncertainty. Okay, maybe, by the way, it's a good idea if for the groups, we are working in groups, could you also make these calculations? How many SMRs, to answer the Akira's question, how many SMRs, how soon we should have this? Just small presentation to be from the general consideration. For instance, I was considering that to be visible, 10% of el electricity production, but you can assume something else with hydrogen. And the end of the, the on Friday, you can deliver this short presentation on this. Yeah, for certain, I, that's a good that's a good challenge, and for certain. You have to close all the coal, I, I coal will, lines. Okay, you're, okay, not, maybe you're not gonna you're not gonna get to a low carbon. Low so low I carbon just wanted footprint. to say, okay, I assumed, for example, to be visible in the, this non-carbon uh, energy, pro clean energy production in 2050. If we want to produce 10 generate 10 percent of electricity in total by SMRs, how many SMRs you need? How many reactors? Let's say you, you can take 100 megawatt electric on new scale. You also can consider the hydro more complicated, but please just calculate and from your estimation. And then, because if you if you start from my simulation, only one per day, that is only 3%, which is invisible, you know, negligible. So, <laughs> it, it's a, but that doesn't kill SMRs because they will need them later and they work and uh, also like planes, even more than planes, nuclear reactors operate for 60 years, 50, 60, 70 years sometimes. So it's investment to the future, actually, in fact. Not one moment. Okay, any questions to Professor Tokuhiro? People, uh, sorry, Akira, people, maybe it's afternoon for you. For us, it's already dark outside. Sun was dead. Oh, so people are tired, but you, of course, we invite you to join us tomorrow and during the discussion, discussions and uh, so on. Okay, thank you very much again. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now.